What's up, everybody, and welcome to Shapes and Colors in Digital Design. Our Thursday webinar, Saros Education, get an award for best webinar starting music. I agree, Allison, 100%. So if you wouldn't mind giving us an award, that would be great. Um, <laughs> welcome. We got a lot of fun stuff that we're going to do today, because as you know, it is the first webinar of the month. And what does that mean? Creative challenges. So uh, here's a little um, overview of what we're going to be doing today. Um, we're going to review our February creative challenge submissions. We're going to have a little bit of an overview of using shapes in digital design as well as color in digital design. Uh, we're going to bring it all together and kind of sandwich it together, so to speak, if we have time. And then we're going to kick off our March creative challenge. So um, without further ado, let's look at some incredible February creative challenge submissions. So as you recall, or if you are new to our creative challenges, we do a post in the community every month, um, giving you a criteria and a challenge to complete within a Saros product, whether it's studio or editor. And if you complete it, you will receive a badge such as the bento and texture badge next to your community profile. So the rules or the guidelines for February's creative challenge, pretty straightforward. Needed to create a bento grid layout experience. If you don't know what that is, we'll look at some. Um, that incorporated texture, our theme for February. Um, and that was about it, right? So you could make the, the experience about whatever you wanted, whoever you wanted, anything you wanted. And we got some dandy, submissions. So uh, upon completing the creative challenge, you would receive the badge, as I said, next to your profile. If you didn't complete February's, that's all right. We're about to kick off March's. So we're going to look at some uh, <laughs> some awesome experiences. Um, we're going to spend about 20, 25 minutes on this. So um, I'm just going to look through them myself, spend about a minute, two minutes on each of them, starting with Saros Educate's very own Patrick McDaniel. Patrick, uh, he is in a meeting right now, so he's not here to watch us ooh and his experience, but this is what he terms his magnum opus, which is a bento box about Costco. <laughs> it's a Costco, he is the Costco king. So looking at Patrick's experience, the textures, that he chose to include uh, were foods from the, the Costco food core. It's too much, the hot dog skin. It's too close. It's too close on the hot dog skin. So a very good uh, grid bento layout here. Um, the Kirkland Signature logo, loud and proud on every single thumbnail. If you click on one of these, you get another shot of the uh, the item, the price, big and bold, but least importantly, the calorie count per serving, which is yikes. I know, right? Or like the pizza one. Like, how about you just don't add the whole pizza thing here with like the cheese? Wait, how come the cheese has more calories than the pepperoni? Shouldn't it be the other way around? Because it's basically a cheese pizza with pepperoni on top of it. I don't know, Pat. He's not here to defend himself, but... Very good job with the textures. The iconic quarter pound all beef Costco hot dog for a dollar fifty, right? Pat is gaslighting us. <laughs> oh, here we go. The hand of God delivering a Costco hot dog. That's too good. Amazing. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. <laughs> The churro, like, name a more iconic American. Like, I would, I would put Costco above Disney World. I'm not a big Disney fan, but I'm a big Costco fan. So, good job, Pat. He gets himself a badge. Amazing work. All right, Adrian's. We're gonna look at Adrian's real quick. Adrian's is awesome. It's all about the Lunar New Year. Look at this awesome masking of texture in the back. Like, this is a really cool video highlight. 
um, that encapsulates the new year and everything perfectly well. So this is really cool. Tons of awesome contrast here. And like the colors that Adrian is using in his are so good. The red and gold, right? And then you get to the actual bento layout of his experience. And we've got these incredible hover states, right? Like look how this all moves in unison. A lot of backend work in the studio here, putting this together. Yeah, love the red color. It looks so good. A little bit about the feast, the traditions, how they celebrate the decor. Really cool. Awesome uses of use of texture. Very vibrant, very on brand. And then he's got these uh, upcoming years as well. Adrian said he was a dragon, so that's why it, uh, he made this bento box about that. But yeah, look at this. Like this really cool menu. Really, really cool. Where could we find the link to these? Um, here, I will send you this. In the creative challenges under the educate, you will find the current challenge, which is bento and texture. And here you can view everyone's amazing work. So I'll slap it in the chat right now if you don't have it. Oh, someone already did it. There was Travis. He beat me to it. Okay. Amazing. Thank you, Travis. Um, yeah, so really cool. Awesome job, Adrian. Vibrant perfectly on brand and a very clean bento box. So a badge for you, Adrian. All right, Travis, I gotta make sure I'm sharing my sounds for this one. Travis did one on his favorite video game, Final Fantasy Volume 7. Wait for it. You guys hear that? He's got a music player. You can pause, you can play. Incredible. Textures from the game, like taking me straight back. I'll pause that for a second. Take me straight back to uh, 1997 when Final Fantasy VII was released. But really cool job, like really old school JRPG graphics, awesome texture, really unique choice um, from Travis for like zooming in on these different textures. Like you're like, okay, how is this texture? They're just images, but think about it like on a grander scale, like these you can tell like these were hand drawn, right? Like 1997 digital art wasn't a huge thing in video game production. So these are all hand drawn concepts. And so like the hand drawn, the pencils, that sort of texture included here is really cool. Same with like these really old low bit graphics, incredible work. Um, Love the font style, you know, to just like really add to the theme. Amazing job. And the buster sword, right? Woo! Victor, <laughs> awesome. That's sick, Travis. Amazing work. Love it so much. All right. This is one of my favorite ones. This is Meg's. Meg, Meg made one about, she made hers about weird animals. Check this out. And knowing Meg, I'm assuming this is all hand-drawn here. Meg, is this a hand-drawn title? Because it is so cool. So amazing use of texture in the background here. Oh, I mean, it's a it's a fun font indeed, but you know what? You could have fooled me. Meg is an incredible artist. Um, the animation of it zo panning and zooming is really cool. Then you get into the actual, <laughs> I love it. The, the color scheme that you've used is incredible. But you get into the actual bento here and the way that you've spaced them is really cool. And it's unique because uh, the requirement I believe was five, yeah, tiles but meg added a few extras that didn't necessarily have any extra content but included extra texture and filled in these gaps really well which allowed meg to resize um her bento boxes differently and kind of space them differently because she has these i guess you would call them filler boxes but it goes really well with the very earthy and natural feel but including very vibrant colors so a really cool let's look at some of these animals a pangolin <laughs> i think gene said that they the way they hold their claws looks like they're eager to ask you a question i think they look pretty nervous yeah nervous pine cones i think that a perfect <laughs> nervous pine cone <laughs> that's incredible look at <laughs> noodle neck these are indeed some weird animals meg i don't do you have a like a just a collection of weird animals? Oh my gosh. Nightmare fuel. Yeah, that is crazy. Look at those eyes. I bet that thing can 
see in the dark. An ore fish, shiny sea ribbon. <laughs> Are these the ones that kind of float like this? Okay, yeah. Um, but really good use of texture and uh, bento layout for Meg, right? I talked about these textures, but like, look at this hover state, right? So see as the, the, the graphics kind of expand as you hover, really, really good polish here. And she added um, texture according to where these animals kind of live, right? So this is a very abstract ocean texture, really cool. The maned wolf, AKA longy long legs. <laughs> that is a crazy looking animal, but that's really cool. The main wolf. Yeah, so really good use of texture. The color is awesome. It's very like natural, right? But she she basically took the vibrancy, increased it. So it has a little more pop than just usual earthy tones that you would associate with something about weird animals. Made it fun, made it vibrant. Um, really, really good job. So incredible use of texture, Meg. Incredible use of the bento layout. I've lost my spot. All right, let's go to Alex, another member of the Saros Educate team. Long live Van Gogh. I love Alex's intro page. Look at that. Really cool texture usage here. She's got the painting texture right underneath. Um, yeah, this is super sick. I'm going to reload it here so you can see. Look at that. See? Super cool. All images from the Van Gogh Museum. Then you get in, thanks my boss bullied me into making one. <laughs> You're welcome. I didn't bully you, I pushed you. <laughs> so really unique use of texture, right? Because it's all paint texture, but really cool. Very well organized, different sizes of, of bento boxes, keeping it interesting. And then with the hover states, Alex pulled a color, as you can see from each of the paintings, as the solid color background. See the blue here, that kind of like bone tan here from the skeleton, you know, some harvesty colors uh, from like the orange, you can see the orange accents in there in the wheat. Same with like the yellow housing, like really cool way to use accent colors pulled from the texture as a part of the hover state. Love the font too, super cohesive with uh, your title page. Awesome, simple layout, love it. So. Really good job. You click on each of these and you can see there's a description and a closer view of it. So love it. Amazing. One more look at the old landing page. Yeah. I love the masking here. Really, really cool, Alex. Um, and then the gradient that she's used on top. You probably didn't notice it at first, but she's got a very subtle gradient that adds a little bit more depth as more more depth than if it were just a solid color background, right? Very subtle. It's not a super harsh or steep gradient, but it adds that extra touch. So um, amazing job. You get yourself a badge, Alex, and I did not bully you. I pushed you. All right, Kaylee, Kaylee, I don't know if you, you made it or not. She's on the other side of the world. Hers <laughs> is about Dunder Mifflin Paper Company. <laughs> I about died when I saw this one. And I don't know how I didn't think about uh, texture and paper, like the perfect texture, right? But on top of that, <laughs> it's Dunder Mifflin. <laughs> She's got Risen Mike down here. Oh, it's too good, right? The typewriter font, perfect. You know, doesn't include too many colors. It keeps it very, very much office, very... Uh, inky and very papery but that the black background and the white text adds a lot of contrast to the texture that she's in, applied here right so look at this really cool texture and then she's got this kind of like paper flipping or edge curling uh hover state so you know there's something on the other side and then that's <laughs> yes, an office an office like product description for craft paper too good uh, something I also want to point out, a small detail that Kaylee included here that is really cool, but when you open these, um, it's it covers up the rest of the uh, bento tiles, and so this page, as, as, it's, as it stands by itself, is super clean and super easy to follow because you can't see of the, any other tiles behind it. Um, just another tiny little detail that Kaylee included here to make it, what does this do? That's what she said. <laughs> I love that there's the different sizes. But uh, really good job. Amazing use of texture, right? Like, 
I don't know where Kaylee got these names. Are these real silk paper? I bet that one's expensive. Oh, look at all the different kinds you can get from there. Woo! Amazing. Yeah, this is so funny. I died when I saw this one. Paper texture, A++ texture, really good bento. Uh, great job of the challenge. All right, Louise, this one, another one of my favorites. Look at the contrast, right? Like natural, organic texture, like we talked about last month during the webinar. Um, very good usage of this. A lot of natural color, a lot of natural texture, um, veins in a leaf, a natural movement even, right? So a lot of very natural texture of all sensories going on back here. Louise, and then contrasted with a very minimal white and simple logo and button here. Oof, it looks so good. And I love pulling this like brighter green in as your accent color. So good, right? Look at this. Awesome video. Everything is very aesthetic. It's all matches super well. The zoom ins on the hover states, right? Ooh, yeah, look at that. Another layer of like bentoing, if verb, if you can turn it into a verb, <laughs> put some more bentoing going on back here. Some more texture, awesome color, like keeping the theme and ooh, this and her play button on the video is so sick. Like that's so sleek. Yeah, really, really good aesthetic here. The green is so cool. Love the home page or the landing page. Love the whole bento. Like it's so good. Very tight grid, keeps them compact, but but still easy to follow. Amazing work, Louise. Love it. All right, Jean. Jean's is all about watercolor. Isn't that so sick? Another really good like texture theme I didn't even think about. But what a bet like what better texture than like watercolor? And so what Jean has done here is had these sort of like canvassy. You watercolor on canvas, you watercolor on paper. I don't really know. Either way. Uh, she's got the paper. All right, so she's got the paper texture in the background, and then she has all of the colors, like essential water colors listed here, and they each have um, texture on top of that of how they look on the paper. Really, really cool. Yeah, so she could have just like included the color, but she incorporated texture as the challenge provoked and uh, really showed you what it looks like on top. Small details that I love uh, that Jean included. The X here looks like it was painted, right? Very small detail, but very cool. And then in each of the colors, she included a picture, a wa water painting using that color. So not only do you see the color here, but you see it in action once you click on the pop-up. Hey, you know, no, I think it's, I think this is super clean. The pop-ups are great because there's a lot of contrast with the, the, the uh, solid white with the, textured graphics. So I think what you did is perfect, Gene. See right here? I think if you had used textured background, it might have not been as contrasted as it is here. So this is really, really cool. Some contextual paintings. Yeah, awesome usage of color, or excuse me, uh, texture. Amazing. All right, Len. Len always brings it with his and shows me all these awesome things that I am just like, I need to watch more Doctor Who, right? So he has made his about an overarching history and wiki of Doctor Who. Like how sick is this? So then he's got three tabs, right? Here's the homepage, got this awesome, awesome video that loops here. And then you go to meet the best doctors and he's got this bento grid of all these doctors. And like, look at these, like, really, really cool hover states. Look how they like slide in and out. That is so sick. Sleek. Yeah, a very unique way of doing this, Lynn. Uh, because we've seen a lot with a pop-up, we've seen a lot with a hover state on top of the grid itself, but to have almost like a carousel of, of the additional information coming down, that's super unique. Yeah, the green makes a pop. Who, yep. Len, you gotta let us know who your favorite uh favorite doctor is. I've only seen a few episodes of the Matt Smith one. I love Matt Smith. I think he's great. Um, you guys see him in House of the Dragon. Yeah, really good. All right, official Len's favorite right here, David Tennant. He looks like he's probably a good doctor. Awesome, 
incredible work. The textured background, right? We're oohing and on at lens layout that we didn't really get to talk about as texture. We're just like, what an awesome patterned background. So this is so good. The live action shots here, like amazing work, Lynn. Super good bento. Mac always never ceases to surprise us. His is about trombone materials. How cool is that? Very similar um, to Kaylee's paper one. He's used different materials used in, in trombones, which I didn't know there were so many. And then you kind of click on this and you get a description of the material and how it affects the trombone plane. That is so sick, right? I didn't know there was plastic. I had no clue. Gold brass. Did you know there's a difference between gold brass and normal brass? I did not know that. Yeah, these have been very informative. You are right, Kelsey. Your wife's a music teacher. Oh, okay, 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 I get it. Yeah, nickel silver, like pretty sweet, right? Really cool uh, layout here where these are mirrored. Like these three uh, sizes, I guess they're technically two sizes, are mirrored down here. So they still create a very symmetrical, symmetrical grid. Awesome. And then this graphic, very hand-drawn, very sketched, adds a lot of contrasting texture from a like a sketched texture to a natural texture, as you can see in these material types. So really, really cool. Love it, Mac. All right, Liana's. Liana's is titled Looney Bean. Bean, if you don't know, is her dog. And so this is an incredible, an incredible bento box about what makes Bean, her dog, so loony. And the textures of all the core tenets of Bean's life, then with the hover states and masking them with the paw prints is too good. So you can see the fuzz texture on the tennis ball, the crunchy, a little bit dusty. Everyone was curious how these taste sort of texture uh, on the doggy treats, the grass, you know, like this is really good. And then of course we get an extra shot of Bean in the hover state. Kind of a similar layout to Lens where you have the bento and then you have the hover or additional content that shows up according to the hover. Oh, look, look at Bean swimming. Did someone say it's summer? <laughs> yeah, incredible. Mud bath, right? You gotta love a mud bath. Yeah, I love it. So Liana, incredible work with yours. You also get a badge. Now let's look at Meredith. Meredith was wonderful. <laughs> Set your mind at cheese. The puns included here and in all of the comments had me rolling. There was a lot of puns. So go check those out. But hers is all about cheese. <laughs> Another very unique texture usage cheese i love the overall aesthetic right any of you have taken intro to design we learned about alignment and anti-alignment and look how unaligned this is but it works so well like it gives a very energetic uh jovial and fun vibe to her entire design and then you get these pop-ups right that mask the rest of the bento you learn more about the cheese and what they pair well with like so good the mouse is so, I love the little mouse. Meredith, this is so good. The cutting board texture, right? Like, look at all these, oof, they look so good. I'm getting so hungry looking at these. The, the hard cheeses, the semi-hard, the, you know, it's like the semi-soft. I'm a big semi-soft cheese fan. More like so Gouda. <laughs> the buns continue. Five major cheese categories with pairings. This was really unique. I love it so much. Going back to the front page again, like, look at that. That's so good with the little mouse. Um, click the, the types of cheese. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, look. These are so good. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Look at how it it highlights the pairing. That is really cool. Good job, Meredith. That is sick. That's so sick. I love it. Yeah, the, yeah, the idea is really great. This is really fun. All right, let's look at Kelsey's real quick. Kelsey, mega nerd, World of Warcraft. <laughs> love it. The smoky mist going on here, setting the mood to welcome to the World of Warcraft. And then the digital art texture that she's included here. Really, really unique texture, right? 
she could have easily just used like graphics shots of the game but she used concept art of the game displaying the texture of like a digital medium very very cool for the word there you go <laughs> yeah awesome bento spaced well a lot of vibrant colors going on here yeah and then yeah the background with like more mist adds a little more depth to it right if it was just a solid black background it wouldn't have quite as much depth so really good job kelsey that is sick all right moving on to nancy's bun heads this is so like elegant. Someone said elegant, right? I think it might have been Len that called it elegant. I can't remember. Yeah. No, oh, exquisite. Even better. Better word choice. Stunning, right? Yeah. Very exquisite, stunning, sleek. A very specific mood that Nancy's uh design brings, right? It's not super energetic, but it's just so like. It encapsulates ballet perfectly and how elegant and, and free flowing and fluid it is, right? Like look just kind of like the, the dresses and the, you know, it's so cool. And then this grain texture in the background is what really got me. Cause that again, contrasts super well with the different bento grid uh, tiles that she includes here. This is a history of ballet, right? And so you can see this awesome, look, look like the detail here of how as her foot bleeds off of the, uh, the container it goes into that uh textured background that is so cool and then here's a quick little history 1700s the 1900s like again look as she go bleeds off of the container she goes into the textured background it is so cool nancy i'm not exactly sure how you did this but i'm assuming there's an image behind this and you took the effort to line them up yeah it was so good very very cool Look at that. Such awesome detail. Color here. Yeah. Very unique use of texture as the images bleed off of the containers. So super, super good. Double layers. Yep. Amazing. All right. Anna's is so good. I got to make sure my sound's on. A sensory glitch of a revenge story. Sweeney Todd, the demon barber. Talk about texture, right? Like audible texture. The rain in the background, does anything set a better mood? That is so, yeah, so immersive, right? The blood flowing, oh, this is so good. The different textures of the environments of the world. We don't need to get into the pies, but like, <laughs> The cobbled streets, right? Like, this is so good. Anna. The sound, like the texture, the sound of people walking on the cobbled streets, right? The footsteps, stone cold, stepping on creaking wood, sharpening a steel blade. You clap, yeah, so good. <laughs> Crazy, right? Oh my gosh, yeah, look at the shadow that pops up, right? That's so good. Yeah, this is, it's Halloween every day for you. Absolutely, what's your favorite horror movie? We got some horror fans on, uh, on the Educate team. We're big into horror. Yeah, the Razor. So cool, like, amazing use of texture because it includes all the visual texture but also the audible texture incredible all right last but certainly not least heather is not here today she couldn't join but tea genie specialty teas look at the dewy tea texture like this looks warm the colors included oh man you come in here very cool colors like you don't see a lot of that kind of like ambery orange when it comes to tea. you see a lot more earthy things like greens and browns and and this logo that she has created here very cool love the bentos here gives you a description of each of the teas right and like what they do how they help i love tea tea is amazing right so awesome i love like the hover states or the object states where they just kind of like roll like keeps it alive keeps it very playful heather Amazing job.
yeah, the, the, the leaf texture in the background is really cool. Um, very flat, very simple, but still includes a lot of texture, right? I love how she's included gradients to soften up a lot of the tiles and a lot of the images here. And then includes the uh, actual image of the different tees. The logo is my favorite part, T Genie. Incredible, so playful. Yeah, playful is the right word, right? Very similar to Meredith, very playful designs um, with the small details that they include. Meredith has this little mouse that pops up from all over the place, right? Um, these really cool hover states. These are just, and these are not organized. They just kind of go. So that's really cool. Um, Heather, not here, but incredible work. Anna, incredible work. That was, all of these were so fun. This is like the best part of our jobs is being able to see everyone's awesome creations. So thank you very much. And we are only four minutes behind schedule. So round of applause for me for not spending too much time on these. Because as you know, last time, I spent the entire time oohing and on everyone's work. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yep. I know. I've, I'm improving here. Okay. So those were so good that I cannot wait to kick off the March Creative Challenge. But before we do, we got to go through our lesson. So we're going to talk about shapes in digital design, and we're going to talk about color in digital design. A brief overview, and then, of course, you're going to practice implementing it with certain guidelines in the Creative Challenge. So we're going to start with shapes. And to start off with shapes, we're going to go to the basics, which is knowing your shapes. There are essentially, fundamentally, three types of shapes in digital design. Geometric shapes, organic shapes, and abstract shapes. As you can see here, I use the, uh, the clover here because it is March, right? Pretty good. Um, anyway, so those are our basic types of shapes. So let's talk about fundamental shape usage. Um, Shapes are a fundamental building block uh, in digital design. And so what I mean by that is they are actually a building block. You can't create a canvas without a shape. You can't create a container without a shape, right? So using shape is essential. Like you can't design without using shapes. And so we're gonna look at the different ways of using them. Um, and so as we go through this, we'll look at some examples of how Seros, as a brand, we incorporate shapes into our design and the different types of shapes, but also think to yourself, ooh, I like that. How can I incorporate that into my design? That'll be key to getting the most out of this quick lesson. So first off, shapes as containers. Think of backgrounds, think of buttons, think of thumbnails, think of all those incredible bento experiences that we just looked at. Um, shapes as a container is a the most fundamental way of using it. So I've got a few examples here pulled from our Seros designs, but I've reduced the transparency of the content to add more emphasis on the shapes used. So as you can see in this, this uh, mobile banner here, we've got a giant rectangle here as the background, and we've got each of these smaller rectangles with rounded corners, softer corners, um, as our containers, and then the content inside. Same with like a button, right? Every No button is a button without the container, that uh, surrounds the, the call to action. We talk a lot about that in our course, Visuals and Digital Layouts, um, the anatomy of a button. And no button is a button without the container around it. Same with this uh, thumbnail here. Not only are these images housed inside a container, but each of these markup comments are, are housed inside a container with a button container as well. So fundamentally, the easiest way to do it uh, use shapes is to use them as containers. And you all do that, but this just kind of helps you see exactly how that is done. So next would be shapes as accents. Think about using shapes in visuals and graphics. We saw a lot of those in our bentos, right? Um, ways to highlight important things and, and indicators. By indicators, I mean uh, bullet points, pointing out titles or call to actions or anything like that. So some more Sarah's designs here, as you can see, we've got all these, we've got a lot of text in this design, but they're all house and containers, which organizes it. But to accent the containers, as we use these geometric and abstract shapes here, um, to bring a little more playfulness and a little more life into the design, right? Sarah's new brand is pretty playful and light, and we like that. And these shapes really help. As you can see, this is like off-centered, it's tilted. So it, it gives it a, a feeling of not being too serious, right? Um, that's something that simple shapes can really bring into your design. See, we've got this little squiggle here. It's, uh, you could consider that a highlighter, which brings your eye to this, this uh, call out here, this quote. 
Um, there's tons of ways of using this. So this is just one very basic example. You can use shapes um, to add a little bit more life into very text heavy documents. I know a lot of us are marketers and writers and look how simple it is to just bring a little bit more life into it by using rectangles and abstract shapes, right? Don't need to include high fidelity graphics. Don't need to include all these crazy stuff. If that is not in your uh, design wheelhouse, simple things like this can really go a long, long way. So shapes as an accent. And so combining both of those would be shapes as visual anchors, right? So creating focal points on a design, including contrast, like we talk about an intro to design and um, creating attention seekers to really navigate a user's eye to a certain part of a design. So look at this little uh, footer created by the Saros design team. You can see we use a squiggle here to, to highlight throw, right? That's a focal point. Um, and we use this arrow here to draw attention to the schedule button, right? And we got some abstract shapes here to do exactly what we talked about um, just before on the previous slide is using them as, as accents. Simple things that really liven this design up. So imagine if we removed all of these. It would look good, it would look clean, it would look minimal, but as a brand, we're trying to make it playful and energetic. And so these very motion-filled um, shapes and graphics add a lot to it. So one small example of creating focal points, creating uh, attention seekers, and adding contrast to the white text. So if we relook at that first slide uh, that I showed you of using shapes as fundamental building blocks, you can see now how uh, we use them in this little call out here. Container, container, container. Using these as accents, add just a little extra touch. And this squiggly abstract shape here is a focal point, right? So it pulls your attention to, we can't wait to meet you, right? And then your attention kind of goes over to here, these big buttons. It, it navigates the user's eye. They know, so usually an, a user's eye will probably go here. Well, might actually start with wait, read this, come here, then bounce up to the call to actions, which is what we want. They might even just go straight to here, to here, which is also totally fine. But you can see how using the shapes navigates the user's eye across the page when there is a good amount of content included. All right. Let's move on to the role of color in digital design, Design, right? So color directs attention through visual contrast. Um, similarly, color helps establish a visual hierarchy. So I pulled this other um, little call to action thumbnail from our website. And if you look at it, how does the color, think to yourself right now, like how does the color navigate your eye through this? Feel free to like close your eyes, look away, look at it again. Where does your eye go first, second, third, and then fourth? And how does color dictate that, right? For me personally, when I look away, look at all this crazy, look at those books, cool. Then I look back, my eye goes from here to the, the, the uh, studio logo, down to the button, and then I go back up to the bigger header and then to the body text. So one, two, three, four. Navigates to the CTA. Yeah, exactly, right? Color really creates a focal point on this, this example here, exactly. And that's kind of what we want our users' eyes to do is to focus on the CTA. And that's why CTAs are important because if they don't read anything here, which oftentimes this won't get read, um, they should know what we're expecting of them within the CTA itself. So yeah, Brenda, exactly. Mine did the exact same thing. So I went up to the logo, down to the CTA, to the bigger header, and then last to the body text. So that should help you know how you should uh, create your visual hierarchy when you're creating very similar things in studio experiences, editor experiences, whatever, right? That should help you understand how to create a visual hierarchy. So if you're spending a lot of time on your text, but your CTA or maybe your header isn't getting quite as much love, I would think about maybe switching that and making a very solid header and then an even more solid um, CTA with a focal point. So just a fun little example. You'll start seeing that everywhere now that we've pointed that out. But uh, most importantly, color evokes emotion in design, right? That is the most important thing. And no matter, and emotion is general and it's vague and it's big. And that can mean a lot of things, but that's the whole point. So we're going to do a quick little exercise. So in the chat, 
tell me what you think or what you feel, I should say. Tell me what you feel when you see this. What was your gut reaction? Calm. Bored. What else? Anything but satisfied. <laughs> anything, anything but satisfied. Allison says I'm being yelled at. Curious what's next. Conflicted. Meh. Bored. <laughs> Huge. Is clean an emotion? I would say, yeah. After you clean your office, you're just kind of like, ooh, right? Structured Apple Keynote 2020 or 2007. A thousand songs in your pocket, right? <laughs> okay, so now tell me what you feel when you see this one. Playful, playful, spring, intrigued. Movement, Easter, Barbie, John. <laughs> Bubble gum, easier on the eyes. More joyful, that's a good one to point out. More joyful, right? Same graphic, color evoked a different emotion, right? Calm, muted. Okay, Saros, <laughs> surprise, they're Saros brand colors. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so now tell me what you feel when you see this one. Ah, Alex says, oh yeah, strong, whoa, intense. Bryson Wireless. <laughs> Aggressive. Anna style, yep. Anna Karina style, one hundred percent. Stabby, stabby is a very good one. Aggressive, hostile, edgy cat metal band cover. <laughs> I'm scared. Carpenter, emo kid. Emo's not dead, Brittany. Uh, you better be. <laughs> My chemical romance. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> Yeah, so same graphic, but you can, this is a very simple example showing you how uh, color evokes emotion. So don't just pick colors because you think they look good. Rather think about the emotion you want them to invoke. Again, we talk about this in our visuals and digital layouts course. I'll briefly summarize here. Uh, there's a lot of this and that in color theory. Um, color theory is pretty objective and there's a lot of caveats to it. So don't give it too much weight. So a general rule of thumb that I like to tell designers is, um, in digital design accessibility has to be taken into account. 100% Brenda. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Um, it must be accessible. So e the contrast ratio must be good enough, um, for viewers to be able to read, but also think about what you want users to feel rather than just being like, I like orange because orange is my favorite color, right? Does orange portray the right feeling that you want them to have? Is red um, going to attract them or does that feel like it's a warning, urgent? You know what I mean? Is blue calming or is, is blue energetic? Is green more, uh, you know, a lot of times we associate greens with organic things, but also like certified, complete, finished, right? So think about the what you want to invoke with your designs and then choose color accordingly um bringing it all together if we have time i put that for myself to make sure that we have time we've got uh i also recently learned more about color blindness i think from a sarah's article i am actually colorblind katie so <laughs> i have a really i'm michael i can't remember what the one that starts with a d like reds greens oranges and browns wow when they're next to each other not a chance am i telling those apart um green and blue yep it's tough like if you were to just like dump out a box of colored pencils and like, hey, organize these per color, I would grab all those colors and just put them in the mud coloring, right? Um, like, like some websites in dark mode. Yeah. Sometimes when you turn on the dark mode, you're like, ooh, that is too harsh, right? 
Good rule of thumb for dark mode, by the way, is to never use black in your dark mode. Use a really dark gray. Black almost adds too much darkness to it. Um, so include a, a, a darker gray. Like think about like the Zoom chat right now. See how they're technically in dark mode, but you can't see any black. Um, it's a dark gray or charcoal color. Black is also cheating. Yeah, and then you notice also in the Zoom chat, we're on a little bit of a tangent here with, with uh, dark mode, but I mean, it still counts because we're talking about colors, but no, so or also notice the chat in the dark mode chat of Zoom. Everyone's little initial icon isn't this crazy vibrant color, right? It's kind of a muted color because that contrasts very well against the darker color. When you have a very like, super bright accent color and a really dark black that's almost too much contrast it gets a little gaudy right so you'll notice in the chat if you're looking at it right now it's a dark dark gray with a lighter gray um as the text bubbles and then everyone's little initial bubble uh is a muted color but it still adds plenty of color contrast and pop to it right so just good rule of thumb i was reading about this and they gave me some good suggestions for uh options to black yeah exactly so when you're making a, an all black or a dark design um or i i shouldn't say design i should say ui because it'll be different with designs but like a ui of any sort um, a dark gray is really really good you can go varying levels of dark gray um let's see this is the i just posed it in the dope oh, i just posed it to uh, me and travis so i'll do it again <laughs> this is the black alternative that Saros uses. So feel free to open that up and try it out. Um, anyway, okay, so now we don't have time to bring it all together because we got on this tangent, I apologize. So what we're gonna do now with the 10 remaining minutes of our webinar is kick off our March Creative Challenge. You saw those incredible February challenges, you've seen the January challenges, and now we're gonna do the March challenges. And this is one I've been looking forward to doing for a long time. So buckle up and brace yourself for QuiltCon 2024, baby. My favorite event of the year, QuiltCon 2024. So let me read you the prompt for our March creative challenge and how we're going to incorporate shapes and colors my grandmother would be so excited i am an avid quilter myself allison and so that is where this came from um let me read through the challenge with you and we'll kick this baby off so quiltcon 2024 here we go it's that time of year again time for quiltcon 2024 the ever anticipated and highly attended conference where avid quilters from around the globe meet to learn share listen and most importantly enter their prized quilts into the annual QuiltCon Quilty Contest and Fair in hopes of winning the coveted first place blue ribbon prize. The 2024 theme is, you guessed it, shapes and colors. So uh, this month, your creative challenge is to enter the annual QuiltCon Quilting Contest and Fair by creating a digital quilt experience in studio or editor using this QuiltCon 2024 submission template. I'll show you the template in just a moment. However, there are certain guidelines you must follow in order to enter your quilt. So I'll look, open this real quick. Uh, let me log into the studio real quick. And so if you've never imported an experience before, this is how you do it. You're gonna see it in real time, right? Um, you click a folder. I'm importing this into Kelsey's account. I apologize, Kelsey, but you get it. <laughs> Um, so you, you click the folder, the project you want to import it into, and then voila, it'll magically show up in your account. Whether you are a studio user or an editor user, you can then open it in the tool and see the experience that you will use to complete the challenge. Now notice there is the title page and then there are four pattern pages, right? And that is what we'll be working off of with a single triangle shape on each of the pages, or pages, excuse me. So going back to the prompt, here are the guidelines. You must use the provided template. You must create an intro page on the template's first page, which I showed you here. Um, you must use that page that includes your quilt's name. So you gotta give your quilt a name, a brief theme or explanation of your design, 
and any accompanying visuals that you'd like to include. Also, you can only, you can only, this is important, use the provided triangle shape asset included in the template with no additional shape types, text, or assets. You are allowed to duplicate, rotate, recolor, and reposition triangles, but you can't resize them. You are allowed, uh, you are also allowed to recolor the canvas, but you can't resize that either. So you can come in here and you can duplicate this as many times as you want to start to create a quilting pattern, right? But you can't resize it. That's a no-no. And you can't add any other assets at all. So this is really going to test your design abilities by constraining what you can do and help you focus on colors and shapes only. So you'll create a quilt pattern however you want to do that, four different ones on these pages. So the goal of this creative challenge is to create four unique uh, digital quilt patterns, one per page, while only utilizing and focusing on shapes and colors. Each page should include a distinct and differing pattern from the others. Here's an example, which I will open up for reference. Uh, note that this is only an example. Kelsey, I think you get this one again too. Woohoo! You're welcome. So here's a quick one that I put together. <laughs> This is breaking my brain, but I'm here for it. Yeah, they're they're creative challenges for a reason, right, Allison? Uh, head start for Kelsey. <laughs> yeah, they're uh, they're challenges for a reason. So here's one that I put together. As you can see, I am only using the triangle shapes, but I have recolored them to create. Even up here, right? I've only used the shapes. I've colored the canvas, and I've. This is probably not the best way to organize the billions of shapes you're going to use. But this is an example, right? And you can import this example into your account, but don't you dare use it in your design. Um, only using the shape to create a quilt pattern. So you will make four of these. Um, again, this is only example. So how you organize your layer panel uh, and your page content will for sure differ. Just as important as a quilt pattern is its presentation. So feel free to include any animations, interactions, states, or transitions you'd like to flare up your submission. Think about Heather's um, T bento box and how she had those kind of rotating things and all that fun stuff. So you can't include any other assets besides the triangle, but you can add interactivity to them to flare up your design if you would like. So you'll have until April 4th to complete this challenge when we will hold our next creative challenge webinar like we've done today, uh, during which we'll celebrate everyone's submission, hand out the quilted badge, for those who complete the challenge. Additionally, we will vote on each other's submissions to declare the blue ribbon badge winner for the creative challenge. <laughs> Good luck, have fun and take risks. So here you go. Upon completion, everyone will receive the quilted badge as a part of their Saros Educate profile. But next month we will vote and the grand prize winner will also receive the ever exclusive first place blue ribbon badge for the best quilt. Uh, can we give our triangles textures or only so solid colors? Hmm. Let's put it to a vote. What does everyone think? Solid only? What else? Yeah, 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 yeah. Solid only, solid only. You're right. I, I was very tempted, Katie. I was very tempted. But I think we do solid only so we can still focus on shapes and colors. So um, you will create something similar to this, obviously a different pattern. You'll create four different patterns um, here. As you can see, feel free to change the canvas color, but don't resize it. And you can add and arrange these however you'd like. I would suggest looking up barn style quilts for some inspiration um, and create four different patterns. Add any sort of flair through interactivity that you'd like. And then a title page with your quilt's name, your theme or explanation, and any accompanying visuals that fall within the guidelines as well. Cool. Any other questions about the March Creative Challenge? I will move this right now to uh, the live space. Whoa. So you can view it and get going on it. But um, excited to make some digital quilts. So am I. These are going to be so fun. I'm super excited about all of these. 
Um, as you know, the the February challenge was a ton of fun. And if you completed it, you will get your badge next to your profile. Like, look at Heather just stacking these up, right? Uh, likewise here, if you complete it, you will get your quilted badge. And if you are the lucky winner, flexible on landing page. All right, okay, I'll, I'll make a... Uh, I'll make a compromise with Katie because I almost caved. Katie, we can include any sort of texture or anything we want on the intro page. So we can include textures on the intro page because Quilt's got some pretty cool textures. So there you go, Katie. Um, but the actual uh, pattern pages themselves, no texture, shapes and colors only, triangles and colors only. So super excited. This is going to be really fun. I've been trying to get this one going for a long time, but it didn't quite fit until this month. So you have until Mar April 4th to complete this. Um, remember to publish your experiences and post them here. We'll chat about them. We'll discuss them. If you have questions about products or how to use the studio or editor, remember in our discussions boards, we have product questions. If you want some feedback or suggestions on your designs, remember we have our design help where Adrian on the Educate team is more than happy to help you out. But with that said, thank you. Good save, Nancy. Yeah, good save, Nancy. All right. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you for being here. And I look forward to seeing your submissions in the 2024 Quilt Con Quilting Contest and Fair. Thank you. And we'll see you on the community. Goodbye.